pleased to give this uh, uh, seminar. Uh, I know that uh, you are uh, attending the seminar from uh, different countries in the world. And once more, I welcome all of you. Uh, the title of my talk is Domiciliary NIV in COPD, but as a matter of fact, I was thinking in preparing this uh, talk to just enlarge a little bit uh, my presentation to different ways also to treat chronic hypercapnia. The first uh, question that I pose to myself when I prepare uh, this talk is try to answer uh, the question why to target hypercapnic patients. And another way to pose uh, the same question is, does hypercapnia somehow determine the long-term outcome of COPD patients? Well, first of all, I want to share with you what is the problem of hypercapnia in these patients. It has been shown that in uh, hypercapnic COPD patient, at least I would say almost half of them may increase the level of PaCO2 of more than 10 millimeter of mercury at night. And these, as you know, occurs mainly in the stage of sleep called REM sleep. But having an increase in PaCO2 during nighttime is able also to influence the level of PaCO2 during daytime. The answer is definitely yes, and therefore we need to understand if being hypercapnic is a risk factor for the survival of these patients. In this study, that it was a real long-term study because it lasted almost 15 years, and therefore, the time frame was very large. The authors divided the patient in those who became, after two years of observation, hypercapnic, represented here by the green line, from those, the blue line, that remain normocapnic. Well, here you can easily see that the survival rate was markedly different in the two group of patients. For example, at five years, survival rate in hypercapnic patient is around, uh, I would say, 45, between 45 and 50% while in non-hypercapnic patient, the survival is around 62%. And then at the end of the day, that means after 15 years, the difference is still present and is still quite big. Interestingly enough, from this slide, you can also see that very early, I would say in the time course, of the years, these two curves diverge. That can suggest that the precox treatment of hypercapnia, therefore the prevention of hypercapnia or the treatment of hypercapnia, may be performed quite early in the uh, time course of the disease. Well, one of the major questions 
is matter of number. Do we have a critical level of PaCO2 from which we should start a treatment? Well, I have no magic number, unfortunately for me and for you, but this graphic may help us to better understand what I mean. Out of more than 2,000 patients, the authors of this study demonstrate that if, you P, if your PACO2 increase around 52, 55 millimeter of mercury, the risk of dying in the following years is 1.5. That means 150% more chances to die in the following year if you became hypercapnic with the value of our PACO2 higher than 50 cent millimeter of mercury. Having said that, finally, the gold document I remind to you that the goal document is not a guideline, but mainly a document of experts, finally included a statement about the use of NIV in chronic hypercapnia. You can see highlight what they wrote in the key points in the bottom part of this slide, and the author stated that in a severe COPD patient with hypercapnia and the history of hospitalization for acute respiratory uh, hypercapnic failure, long-term non-invasive ventilation may decrease mortality and prevent hospitalization. So let's start now to tackle the major treatment for hypercapnia in COPD patients, that is NIV. As you know for sure, NIV has been considered the gold standard for the treatment of acute hypercapnia respiratory failure. But here the question is a bit different. What's about long-term application of an IV in chronic respiratory failure? First of all, we need to understand if chronic NIV, that means home NIV, is routinely performed at least in Europe. In this survey that we published already six years ago, we found out that around one over three patients discharged from the hospital with hypercapnia and long-term ventilation are COPD patients. And interestingly enough, there are some countries like, for example, Germany, Turkey, and Switzerland, where the use of NIV on long-term basis in COPD patients is higher than 50% of the patient in which you prescribe long-term NIV. Why chronic NIV became popular and I would say not yet probably the standard of care but suggested by the main documents and we also see later guidelines because in the recent years we gain a lot of information from well-performed randomized control trials. The classical one was performed in stable patients. We'll see later 
in a minute what is the difference between stable and I would say unstable patient. In the study the authors randomized patient with severe hypercapnia to the standard treatment I would say with oxygen represented here in the graphic in a Kaplan-Meier uh, curve by the blue line while patient randomized for nocturnal NIV are represented here with a red line. This graphic I think is self-explanatory. You don't need to spend much work to understand that there is a large scissor immortality between the group of patients treated with, I would say, only oxygen. Mortality at one year was 32% versus a much lower mortality rate, 12% in the group undergoing long-term NIV. Plus, the studies show a reduction in acute exacerbation requiring hospital admission. That means, in my view, also money saving. Later on, a couple of years later, paper out of Holland was considered to be negative. Well, I want to show you another view of this study. First of all, remember the German study that I show you in the previous slide was performed in stable patients. Here, the study enrolled patients after ventilatory support for acute respiratory failure. <clears throat> what the author did, they randomized after I would call only 48 hours after termination of acute ventilatory support to NIV or as already done in the German study to standard treatment. That means medical therapy and oxygen. The primary endpoint was a composite index, time to readmission for respiratory causes of death of the patient. And then there was a lot of other physiologically secondary endpoints. Well, here is the major, I would say, endpoint about the composite index. And as you see here from this not smiling face, the authors uh, consider that NIV was not better the standard treatment in reducing hospital admission and mortality rate. And this is what and how most of the clinicians consider this study. However, one may claim why that. And if you look at the graphic that they honestly show in the paper about the level of PaCO2 at randomization and during the time course of the year, it is obviously apparent that already after three months or treatment, both groups showed a significant decrease of the level of PaCO2. And this may question the result of the study as they are mainly showing congresses and journal clubs. Probably, these uh, negative results were due to the fact that at enrollment, they mixed up patients with hypercapnia, as I said, after 
termination of ventilatory support represented a sort of mixed cohort with both patients with chronic, real chronic respiratory failure and other with transient hypercapnic chronic failure. This is because they could mix up patient with acute on chronic and real acute respiratory failure. And this may explain why also the standard treatment group significantly reduce the level of hypercapnic. I think the most important study that I would say reconcile the two data that I show so far, the German and the Dutch study was a study performed outside Europe, uh, at least uh, right now in the UK, and still patient in the UK receive uh, acute intervention with NIV for a severe episode of acute hypercapnic respiratory failure. But then they were very wise and they allowed the patient to go home for a time frame between two and three weeks and then they reassess the patient and in particular the level of acidosis and CO2. And what they did, they only enroll patient with persistent hypercapnia after an episode of acute respiratory failure. And this study design, as you understand, is totally different from the one performed in Holland. Once more, they randomized people to standard uh, treatment with oxygen and medical treatment or oxygen plus home mechanical ventilation. Let's see whether this different approach has different results compared to the Dutch study. First of all, their composite index was quite similar to the one performed in the uh, Dutch study, was a composite index including survival or death and admission free from the hospital for an acute exacerbation. As you can see here in the, uh, I would say, pale blue line are represented those patients on home NIV and on orange line you can see patient with oxygen alone standard treatment. Well, let's see not only the kaplan mayer curve that is quite, uh, I would say, self-explanatory. Is It is obvious that those patients with prolonged NIV, they did much better than those with standard treatment. But let's see, for example, the medium time to readmission to the hospital. In the oxygen group, the medium time to readmission was 1.4 months versus 4.3 in the home mechanical ventilation group. Then one year risk of readmission was almost 81% in the group on oxygen and 64% in the other group. And the number of exacerbation in the following year was markedly reduced as well. So this paper, in my view, reconciled the use of NIV after an exacerbation of COPD. That means that you should consider the use of home NIV only on those patients who show persistent hypercapnia 
after this episode for a time ranging between two or three weeks from the discontinuation of acute NIV. In the meantime, the two most important world society, the European Respiratory Society and the American Thoracic Society, came out with practical guidelines about the use of NIV in stable hypercapnic COPD patients. And they came, came out with a very similar recommendation. Once in a lifetime, finally, the two societies, they were on the same track. I show you for, uh, I would say we are European, uh, only the ERS guidelines. And uh, to answer to the first question, should long-term NIV be used in stable patients with COPD as compared to not using NIV? I would call the German approach. The task force suggested that long-term NIV should be used for patients with chronic stable hypercapnic respiratory failure with a conditional recommendation. That means that you are not really obliged always to send home a patient with stable hypercapnia, but the group recommended anyhow the use. Similar conclusion were uh, like uh, stated to answer the other question. Should long-term NIV be used after an episode of acute hypercapnic respiratory failure with COPD as compared to not using NIV? And this is, was matter of a UK study. Once more, the panel suggests the use of chronic NIV if hypercapnia obviously persists following the episode. For sure, you know that there is a trend nowadays common to many clinicians that one, the best way actually to ventilate this patient is to target the normalization of PaCO2. And this was uh, more or less called high intensity NIV, applied quite high inspiratory pressure in an attempt to normalize the level of CO2. Well, the task force here, they, well, they were not really um, able to make a, uh, a, a strong treatment uh, because the ERS task force suggests titrating it through NIV to normalize or reduce CO2 level, but with a very low certain of evidence. Because the clinical uh, results were not really clear, and the compliance to the patient, to these, uh, I would say, quite aggressive settings, uh, may vary a lot. And once more, you need to consider that applying so high pressure, so aggressive setting, you may, at least in a subset of patients, uh, damage the cardiac function. As a matter of fact, in this physiological study, I, uh, I warn you to pay attention to the uh, CO, that means cardiac output, during spontaneous briefing here, low intensity NIV and high intensity NIV. So you can see here we observe a statistically significant decrease from 5.5 liter per minute, that is obviously a normal cardiac output, 
to four in patients with high intensity NIV. And this may pose some caution in applying so aggressive settings, at least in patients with some form or car of cardiac uh, uh, impairment. But the main question is always the same. Is long-term NIV always well tolerated in real life? What I show you so far and the statement of the task forces were based on randomized control trial. And one of the main criticisms of this randomized control trial is that the patients are strictly supervised, strictly followed, and some may claim that in real life you may get different results. But I want to see the other side of the coin. Maybe hidden somewhere in the result, all the randomized control trial, at least the most recent randomized control trial, honestly declare the percentage of dropout of patients without a minimal compliance to the treatment. That means at least three hours a night. And here you see a large variation between 11% in the UK study up to almost 48%, that means 50% in the Australian study that I did not show. And honestly, also the always considered to be the most impressive study, the German one, got a remarkable dropout or lower compliance in almost 40% of the patient. So to think a little bit out of the box, is there any other option to treat this patient or let's see to improve the compliance of this patient even those who just got the tolerance of about three hours a night one may think to use high flow nasal cannula that became very popular especially during the covid19 infection just to define what we mean for high flow nasal cannula is the addition of sufficient warmth and high levels of humidification to breathing gases at high flow rates by modified nasal cannula. So I want to be clear, this device, it is not a simple oxygen device. As some people still think, oh, high flow means high oxygen. Not really. The mechanism of high flow nasal cannula is the flow. And then you can set obviously a FiO2, but can even use high flow nasal cannula with, without real uh, increased oxygen, increase at 21%. High flow means an inspired gas up to 80 liters per minute with a few humidification, 35 Celsius, 100% relative humidity. But once more, we are interested in the clinical side. So is there any, I would say, benefits of applying these devices in chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure? Well, before talking about clinical results, we need to understand the rationale of this question. I just uh, uh, suggest you to read uh, this paper. Uh, it's uh, very exhausted about the rationale and physiology of these uh, devices. Well, the main mechanism that can possibly contribute to improve uh, the outcome of patients with hypercapnia are the following. The device may enhance mucociliary clearance, this is rather obvious, may provide washout of that space. I think this is the most important 
physiological issue that we are going to details in the next slide. It may attenuate the inspiratory resistance, increasing the expiratory resistance. And then the mechanism of high flow nasal cannula is that you may also offer the possibility of, uh, uh, I would say, increase a little bit the level of positive airway pressure that may be useful in uh, COPD patient to counterbalance the level of intrinsic pain. Wash out of naryngeal dead space. Why that? Well, we know from the normal breathing that at the start of inspiration, the nasopharyngeal dead space contains end expiratory gases, which eats and humidify inspired air but obviously reduces the efficacy of gas exchange. And therefore, we can, we can get some uh, residual of CO2 at the end of expiration. This slide is very didactic. In this cartoon, you see from top to bottom the application in a model of human airways of 15, 30, and 45 liters per minute of high flow nasal cannula. And then you got in the different panel three different inspiratory timing 0.5, one second, and two seconds. The red, uh, I would say, droplets represent the amount of CO2 still present at the end of expiration. And you can clearly see here that increasing the level of uh, flow and increasing the inspiratory time, the washout of CO2 is really impressive. I also said to you something that uh, I would say surprised some clinician because as positive uh, physiological mechanism, I also state an increase in expiratory resistance. And one may claim, well, 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 pause a moment. Why a increase in expiratory resistance should help our patient? They already have an increase in resistance, true? But if you remember, how most of your patients with pulmonary emphysema breathe, they are just, just breathing like this, with the, what we call poor sleep breathing. That leads with the recruitment of the expiratory muscle and with the poor sleep, an increase in resistance. And this mechanism of prolonging ex expiration avoid a premature collapse of the airways, giving more time to the expiratory flow to leave the lungs. So simulating this briefing, high flow nasal cannula may be very helpful in COPD patients. From a clinical point of view, well, from a clinical point of view, in this physiological study, we show that compared to baseline, then be standard oxygen, the application, for example, of high flow nasal cannula at the flow of 30 liters per minute in COPD patient was able to increase the expiratory time from 1.9 to 2.3, giving more time to the lung to empty, reduce obviously breathing frequency, but most important, reducing the effort that our main muscle, the diaphragm, is uh, uh, exerting. On baseline, this pressure was quantified in 13.5 centimeter of water, and then it dropped down to 8.2. Obviously, when we compare high flow with NIV, the reduction in the effort 
and also the prolongation of expiratory time was significantly more pronounced. So I don't claim here that the physiological effect of high flow nasal cannula are superior or even equal to NIV. What I'm stating here is that high flow nasal cannula may be an alternative way to not oblige the patient to stay for on NIV for a too long uh, and too prolonged period of time. From another clinical point of view, in this randomized control trial published in Japan, the authors compare in a crossover study the potential difference in transcutaneous or arterial CO2 in COPD patient with hypercapnia during oxygen treatment, standard oxygen, or high flow nasal cannula. As, as you can see here, they were able to reduce both level of CO2 by almost 5 millimeters of mercury compared to standard oxygen after the end of the application period. One word of caution in uh, applying high flow nasal cannula in COPD patients. Here we study two groups of people, the uh, blue one, pure COPD patient, and the red one, those with overlap syndrome. That means uh, uh, overlap between obstructing sleep apnea and COPD. And you can clearly see here that while high flow nasal cannula is working very well in pure COPD, in reducing the level of CO2, this may not be the case in patients with overlap syndrome where other, um, other physiological mechanisms may play a major role. So, what I'm telling you here, what I'm suggesting you here, is that high flow nasal cannula probably alone does not help much the hypercapnic patient. But I think that the combination of NIV with high flow nasal cannula for the reason I told you before is a sort of nice pair. Thinking out of the box can be something that we can apply in the future in the intervals on NIV instead of providing only oxygen. And this has been shown by another study done in our, uh, in our group in collaboration with the Tufts University in Boston in which uh, we compare high flow nasal cannula with standard oxygen during NIV intervals. And then you can see here in uh, the use of high flow versus standard oxygen improve uh, uh, respiratory rate, dyspnea score, and increase the comfort score. Increasing the knowledge about the combination of the two methods that I think will be more or less the future for the treatment of home uh, patient with hypercapnia. One word about a very innovative uh, technique, what we call extracorporeal CO2 removal. Well, this is a sort of uh, uh, futuristic way of seeing the problem. The underlying concept is uh, close, I would say, to the dialysis, so that we call it pulmonary dialysis. Well, this was, uh, we performed actually a proof of concept study here in our hospital in, uh, uh, in an attempt to better understand if uh, extracorporeal, in an extracorporeal device, a non-invasive one, very small catheter, was able to get a good CO2 clearance even in patient refractory to long-term NIV. So we enrolled a, a number of patients 
refractory to NIV treatment and what we did, they underwent for 24 hours to a removal of CO2 with an extracorporeal circuit. These are the cis patients, I'm sorry because the one in the middle of the upper end side uh, disappear, I don't know why, but you can see here uh, two main uh, results. All of these patients decrease obviously CO2 when the device was applied. This was good, but obvious. The thing that I, uh, that I found interesting is that the return to baseline largely varies between the patient. In this patient, for example, uh, 72 hours were needed to go back to the previous baseline CO2, when this patient, after only half a day, the level of CO2 returned to baseline. But this is what happened also for the renal dialysis, right? There are some patients they need dialysis once a week, others once every three days, and others after only one day. So it's a sort of different response uh, to the clearance of CO2. But this is only, I would say, a dream, an innovative, uh, um, an innovative way to approach hypercapnia. Well, I uh, will finish with uh, uh, something that still puzzles me a lot. Which is the best way to ventilate with this patient? Well, the question in my view that most of the people are asking me when I speak at congresses, when I have a, a guest here in our unit, should we use fixed pressure mode, like pressure support, pressure control, or adaptive of how to try treating pressure modes? And this is uh, an amyletic question, to be or not to be. And the task force suggests using fixed pressure mode as first choice, rather than use this adaptive of how to treat in patient. And I try to explain why we conclude this in our task force. What is an hybrid mode? When hybrid modes, they can be divided in volume target mode, and volume target mode, uh, they can target a preset tidal volume, such as the average volume assured pressure support, or in other devices, they target a preset alveolar ventilation based on a, a simple formula. In either case, the target is achieved by monitoring respired volume, volumes using a pneumotachograph, and then they automatically adjust the pressure support within a range, a preset minimum and maximum range, to achieve the, what they decide, the clinician decide to be the minimal tidal volume on the minimal ventilation level. So here you got two different philosophy. On one side, you have fixed mode, pressure support, pressure control, the classic logic, and hybrid mode, what the engineer called fuzzy logic. Uh, too difficult to understand, probably, for me, it was not so easy. I tried to simplify everything. Here is a combination of color. The classical logic permits conclusion that there is a green or red, for example. However, there are also propositions with variable answer, such one might find when asking a group of people to identify a color. In other words, I can classify green like this, and another fellow they may classify green like this. And this is a logic of fuzzy logic, like to try to set according to the need of a patient the level of, uh, of ventilation. And this is a very interesting assumption for a ventilatory mode. But do they work in real life? Well, here I found in 2019 a sort of revision of the literature. Here they compare the five studies comparing the fixed mode with the mode targeting tidal volume. And you saw that, you know, they 
reach an conclusive uh, uh, conclusion. The main outcomes were they vary. In some study, they show that the tidal volume was lower. In other were in other studies higher, and and in two study they did not found any difference. Uh, indeed, you need to always consider that the performance of the ventilators, as uh, nicely described by Brigitte Farou, with regard to their ability to respond or not to a pathological situation, may vary widely. And no ventilator at that point in time, that was 2010, was able to adequately deliver a minimal tidal volume without an overshoot or a severe patient ventilator desynchrony. For this reason, when you apply this uh, mode, it's very important to have a very accurate monitoring system, as you may have with the integrated belts in the uh, BRIAS device, and they come also with this uh, quite interesting and clinical-oriented uh, interpretation guide performed by uh, Jean-Michel Arnaud and Christophe Perrault. Uh, the other, uh, very briefly, the other uh, hybrid mode consider not only tidal volume, but alveolar ventilation, as I told you before. For example, IVAPS combines pressure support with a target volume aimed to guarantee a set alveolar ventilation. And I was, and I was just mentioning to you before, uh, alveolar ventilation is calculated with a very simple for, formula, considering the anatomical dead space. However, we know that physiological dead space is equal to anatomical plus alveolar dead space, okay? But in healthy ad adults, alveolar dead space can be considered negligible. However, in lung disease, where they they, these uh, two dead space may vary considerably because uh, the, diff the diffusion membrane of alveoli does not function properly on when there are ventilation perfusion mismatch defects. So the idea behind may be interesting, but the clinical application is not always uh, uh, satisfactory. And as a matter of fact, here are the review of the study comparing uh, the two methods, fixed mode versus variable mode targeting alveolar ventilation. The main outcome, all they were similar. So no method is better than another. And I'm going to finish. The new toys, the new kid on the block is the force oscillation technique to set the EPUB and to avoid flow limitation. A lot of emphasis was placed on flow limitation. And AVAP's uh, um, mode uh, combines the target volume to an automated adjustment of EPUB level. Obstructive apneic events are detecting using what I said before, the force oscillation technique that dynamically determines upper airway resistance. Apneic events are detected, EPAP is increased to obtain error patency. This is a, theoretically a quite nice uh, view, but you need to consider that not many people got really uh, hyperinflation and not, uh, um, and not many people may also uh, at the same flow limitation, uh, changing, for example, the position. And then you need to remember that you see here, nicely illustrated in this cartoon, we got different flow limited section in our lungs and even within the same lungs. So which part of the lung we want to privilege? The one with flow limitation, with other one with, without flow limitation, how big is the part with flow limitation, and how big the part with, without flow limitation. So the answers still need to come. And I finish as I do sometimes stating what Hickey Pop uh, 
uh, sing in the song Live Behind the Mask. And uh, he said, you are wearing a mask and you look better that way. Uh, I thank all of you. Uh, I am one minute late, I guess. Uh, I'm really open to uh, answer to your question and once more. I thank Carl and all the Breas team for the possibility of uh, uh, getting me to give this uh, talk. Thank, thank you to all and thank you to Breas. Thank you, Professor Nava, for this uh, interesting lecture and the excellent timing, I must say. Uh, during the meeting and during your explanations, we got a few questions in here on the chat. Um, there are questions on high flow, on EFL, on NIV. Uh, maybe we'll take the order as you uh, did during your presentation. Um, around NIV, I see here um, a question. Which interface do you prefer to use for COPD um, at home? Is it nasal mask, full face mask or nasal pillows? Uh to be honest, I can't answer to this question because we have different uh, way of speaking, right? Different languages and different faces. So this is strongly dependent of your nose. I have a big nose, other have a very small nose, some have a very huge forearm, other not. Uh, the, the chin is important. So I would say that uh, you need to try on your patient and decide according to the uh, physiognomy of, of your patient. For sure, uh, I never, uh, I'm never stuck with a single interface. Uh, I ask the patient to try at least a couple and eventually to, I would say, rotating the, the interface if I need it. So we have a lot of uh, uh, interface, we have a lot of size, we have even have a, a mouthpiece, so we have a huge range of possibilities and given a recipe, uh, right now it's, it is really difficult for me. Choose the best for your patient, not the best for you as a clinician, I guess. Okay, thank you. Uh, you already touched on the mouthpiece because there's also a question here, if there is place for mouthpiece ventilation during the day, for some COPD patients? Even even during night time. I mean, we know from the study, from the pioneering study of the back group in patients with neuromuscular disorder, we were keeping the mouthpiece, uh, some of them even during night time. Uh, to be honest, I do not have any experience with nighttime mouthpiece, so I can't tell you how well tolerate can be and how effective it is in real life, but uh, obviously uh, mouthpiece ventilation was popular, I would say, 25, 30 years ago, uh, more or less when I was started uh, uh, the, my interest in uh, ventilation, and now it became once more popular. So it's like the skirt of a woman, right? Sometimes they get longer, sometimes they get shorter, I don't know. but. Uh, but it's inter it's a, it is an interesting uh, uh, option for sure. Jeff, don't laugh. I saw. I see you. Okay. Okay. There's another question on uh, NIV for COPD. Is again a bit more practical question. Shall all COPD patients under NIV have a heated humidifier during therapy, even at home? Well, if I have to say yes or no, I would say yes. Obviously, there are differences, but uh, if you use uh, the hygroscopic uh, uh, filter, the HME, you need to consider that you need to change them very frequently because otherwise, uh, if you use more than 12 hours or 24 hours, uh, they don't work properly and they actually increase the depth space. So you may further increase CO2 level and increase work of breathing. So unless you are you live in a very rich country where uh, you can get uh, uh, 365 uh, uh, HME uh, in a year, otherwise I suggest to you it humidifier and then it humidifier. When when well set, you need to have like a sort of training are quite more comfortable than uh, uh, heated humidifier. Then sorry that HME. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. A few questions on high flow nasal cannula. Um, 
When using high flow nasal cannula for the stable hypercapnic COPD patient, is it needed to use 37 degrees Celsius and titrate the flow as high as tolerated by the patient? Now we, got, we, we talk about chronic. So the, the study that we had so far in chronic uh, hypercapnic respiratory failure never go up uh, 35, 40 liter per minute. I mean, in, in acute respiratory failure, when the, when the respiratory drive is high, like when the patient <gasps> are breathing like this, then obviously you need higher flow, like 60 or 80 liter per minute. But usually in stable patient, uh, 30 liter per minute are more or less the same. 37, one more. Uh, it, it is suggested to have 37, but in real life, you know that you need to accomplish also the tolerance, of the, the tolerance of the patient. For sure, 37 is the ideal temperature to give a sufficient humidification also of the airways, but uh, it's not mandatory. Uh, some patients, they think that it's too hot, so we may go down to even to 35, sometimes to 34 uh, on long-term basis. But uh, once more, it is strongly dependent on the patient tolerance. Ideally, 37 is the temperature, but uh, be flexible. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, oh, oh no, there's one coming in here, one more on high flow nasal cannula, just coming in right as we speak. Is there a place for the usage of high flow nasal cannula without additional oxygen? Yes, uh, I mean, uh, you, I mean, the, the interesting mechanism is the, the trick is the flow, then oxygen as needed. I mean, you can get during uh, a COVID-19 infection in severely ill patient, you may go up to 100% FiO2. But just to remove CO2, sometimes you need maybe only a flow. The mechanism, remember, is the flow. Then you can add oxygen, obviously. But uh, uh, because most of, the, of these patients with COPD ventilated at night, they need oxygen, right? Uh, however, it's not oxygen itself. It's the flow that flushes the CO2 at the end of expiration that uh, allows the mechanism of prolonging expiration with a, as a per sleep breathing uh and uh, the application of a small amount of peep so it's not necessary okay thank you uh last question here in the chat so for the attendees if you have open questions post them now because we're about to have the last question here in the chat um on efl which you mentioned at the very end of your talk how is the prevalence of EFL in the overall COPD population? Who knows? <laughs> this is a huge problem. You know, I mean, first of all, I didn't show you any data because as a matter of fact, we had three papers. A lot of emphasis was placed in, uh, uh, in this technique, but we have very few papers. Uh, we know that uh, a certain amount of COPD may have uh, flow limitation, but first of all, we don't know if a, a critical level of flow limitation to target is uh, X number, X minus one, X minus two, we don't know. So we don't know a threshold of uh, clinical import, minimum important flow limitation. We don't know how many patients has flow limitation we do not know how many of these patients are not flow limited in the sitting position and now many of them are flow limited when they switch to supine position. So these unfortunately are still questions to be answered in the future. So my gut feeling is that obviously uh, uh, flow limitation does not necessarily mean uh, uh, intrinsic PEEP because uh, the mechanism is more complex. But even if you want to consider what we know more, the presence of intrinsic PEEP, I would say that most of the COPD patients have intrinsic PEEP, but most of them they have an amount that is so small that is clinically not relevant. So we still we still have a huge question mark about about this problem. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you, Professor Nava. I'll have a last last look here. There is no more questions in the chat. So then I'd like to thank you for this very interesting lecture. It was very entertaining as usual. And I would also like to thank all attendees here from this webinar uh, for the time we spent together today. I hope you learned a lot uh, from Professor Nava. So thank you for joining.